Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to look at the woman who was caught in adultery in John chapter 8. And this is called No Condemnation, No Sin. And I'm going to explain that later on. But basically we're going to look at the woman who was caught in adultery and just kind of dig around in here and see what we can find and what we can learn from this passage. Okay, so we're going to start in verse 3. Scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery to Jesus. They made her stand before them. Then in verse 4 it says, they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Verse 5, in the law of Moses, we are commanded to stone her. What do you say? Verse 6, they said that to test Jesus in order to accuse him. They were trying to get evidence to gather up a case against him. But Jesus bent down and began writing with his finger on the ground. Verse 7, they continued questioning him. He stood and spoke and said, Let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. Verse 8, again, he bent down to write on the ground. Verse 9, when they heard this, they began to leave one by one, the eldest first, until no one was left but Jesus and the woman standing there. Verse 10, Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11, No one, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go and sin no more. So this is a very clear picture of the character of Jesus and of his nature. So let's just look at some verses here. Let's notice that the scribes and the Pharisees were the ones who brought her to Jesus, okay? So let's remember that, that they were the ones that were initiating this accusation, the scribes and the Pharisees, okay? Let's also look at their words. What were their words? Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, okay? This is their accusation, caught in the act. Now, then they say, in the law of Moses, the law, which was in effect during Jesus' entire life that he was on earth, it was in effect. And it was right and good and obedient and lawful to obey the law. See? So they're saying, in the law, we are commanded to stone her. The command for this is stoning then they say, what do you say? I want you to notice here where there is this dichotomy being set up, okay? These law abiders come and present this criminal to Jesus. She's a criminal according to the law. But if you notice, there's a dichotomy being set up here between the law and versus Jesus. What do you say? The law says this. The law is the ultimate authority. But what do you say? Do you see this opposition here? Jesus versus the law. I want you to notice that just starting here, starting to be clear. Then in verse 6, they said that to test Jesus. They wanted to test him so that they could not only accuse her and everybody else, but they wanted to accuse him so they could kill him. But did Jesus stand up and argue with them? Did Jesus say anything? No. What did he do? He did something. He bent down and began writing with his finger on the ground. This is the same finger that formed this woman caught in the act of adultery formed her in her mother's womb. That same finger bent down to write in, in the dirt. Number seven, verse seven, they continued questioning him. I want you to see this 
because everyone, and all the times I've heard this, everyone's obsessed with the writing in the dirt, and everyone portrays her as being on the ground. Somehow they threw her down, or she's, um, you know, cringing as she's about to get stoned uh, down on the ground. But I want to read the actual text and see what it says. So, so right as he begins to, uh, he bends down and begins writing with his finger on the ground, what do they do? What is the Pharisees and the scribes' response to him writing on the ground? They continue questioning him. They continue questioning him. Then he stands up from writing on the ground and he speaks. And he says, let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone all right then verse 8 again he bent down to write on the ground what does the next verse say verse 9 when they heard this they began to leave it doesn't say when they saw this when they saw what he was writing on the ground. No, it says, when they heard this, they began to leave. So the action of Jesus that made them leave is what Jesus said here. Let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. So it was his words that cut them to the heart. It was his words that convicted them. And notice here, after he speaks, they began to leave. The scribes and the Pharisees are obeying Jesus. They're obeying Jesus. One by one, the eldest first, until no one was left but Jesus and the woman standing there. So they have all gone, and now we have left Jesus and the woman. And I want you to notice, where is it, um, that the woman... In many of the images I mentioned before, she's down on the ground. She looks like she's about to be stoned, but the stoning never happened. It was not initiated yet. What we see her doing in this passage is standing here. They made her stand once, and then we see her st still standing down here with Jesus. So there's two verses where she's standing. In between those two, maybe she fell down and stood back up. We don't know, but it's not written, okay? So don't imagine her on the ground with the Pharisees with the stones. They hadn't gathered up the stones yet. They were testing Jesus. That was their uh, intention at that time, to test him. So she was just waiting to hear the conclusion, and so they were accusing her, but Jesus comes in and intervenes. Now, he straightens up from the second time bending down to right on the ground. He stands up and speaks to her and says, Woman, where are your accusers? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? And then she says, no one. And then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So I made some notes here and I want to go over some things. I tried to find some pictures, but there's very few pictures of her standing. Most of them are her down on the ground. But I found this one where she's here and she's standing. These are the Pharisees here, 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 and here. And then this is Jesus over here. And these are a, another picture of some Pharisees, and I put them up high because they're very high and mighty. So, the woman was standing here and here. We never find her on the ground. The scribes and Pharisees stopped what they were doing and left because of what Jesus said. What did he say? Let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. And then he says, where are your accusers. I love this. Why? Because, again, remember up here how we, sh we saw this dichotomy starting with the law over here and Jesus over here, the law, and then what do you say we should do with her? See, they're setting him up 
to break the law so they can accuse him of that. So he says, where are your accusers? When he says that, woman, where are your accusers? Again, here, Jesus is separating himself from the law. He has intervened in the consequences of the law, which she would be dead if the consequences of the law took full force. She would be condemned to death and stoned to death. But Jesus is intervening here and saying, woman, where are your accusers? Because I spoke words of life here, all the evil disappeared. They're gone. So he was declaring, in a sense, his omnipotence here in the fact that evil dispersed with one sentence that he spoke. And this question that he asked her, woman, where are your accusers? He is separating himself from the law here. Why? Because the law accuses. Remember, the Pharisees and the scribes were enforcing the law. But now Jesus says, where are your accusers? From the law, we get accusation. So when he says, where are your accusers? Obviously, she knows that he has made them all run away. But he's saying, where are your accusers in this? He is separating himself from the law again up here, the law and Christ. Here is separating himself from the law. And this is similar to another verse that he spoke to the Pharisees that also separated him from the law. And that was John 5, 45. And what did he say in that? He said to the Pharisees, Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. Scribes and the Pharisees had their hopes in the law of Moses. They were like the rich young ruler and thought that they had obeyed all the laws and that they were perfect. They were um, good like God. So they thought they were God. So in John 45, Jesus definitely separates himself from the law. And I see him in this passage separating himself from the law. Again, it's kind of a theme if you dig. Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? Well, the law should have condemned you and was supposed to, but I intervened. Why is Jesus separating himself from the law? Because Jesus Christ is the rescuer of humanity. If the law were in place and we were all under the law, no one could be saved. No one could be saved. So Jesus came to interrupt that and to live the perfect life for us and to give us credit for doing that because he knows we could never do it. So it's almost as if in this statement here, this question here, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? It's almost as if he's saying, never in my presence will anyone ever be accused. That is not my job. And I'm not going to be a party to that. My job is to rescue. My job is to save. My job is to give life. And let's look also down here where he asks her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she says, No one. And do you see how she knew that he was not going to condemn her? She wouldn't have said, No one if she had thought that there was a chance that he was going to condemn her. All the accusers were gone. And he says, woman, where are your accusers? But he's still there, see? And so she could have thought that he was an accuser too. But because she said right away, no one, this lets us know that there was something special going on between them. She knew and she sensed his mercy. He, she knew and sensed that he was her friend. She knew and understood that he was there to save her. 
See, he was there to save her. He intervened. And he said, woman, where are your accusers? Well, if there was any chance that he could have been about to accuse her in her mind, she would have never have said this. No one. But she said no one. And that lets us know that she knew that Jesus Christ had no intention of accusing her. In fact, he was in the opposite camp. In the opposite camp, separating himself from the law. And then, in verse 11, uh, after she says no one, he says, Then neither do I condemn you, or I do not condemn you. And then, as a result of him not condemning her, then he says, go and sin no more. He didn't say, go and sin no more, I do not accuse you, because that would be backwards. First, he says, I do not condemn you. That is Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation. When there is no condemnation, you have the freedom and the power to go free from your chains and not get bound up in sin anymore. I want you to see that. First comes the, not, the no condemnation, then comes the freedom from sin. Let's look at this a little bit more. When Jesus says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Do you know what this is? This is a picture. This, this, this last verse here, after she says no one is going gonna, is gonna to accuse me. This is a picture of John 1.14 right here. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. This is a picture of John 1.14 where it says Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. Remember, grace always comes first. So grace and truth. Look here. Grace and truth. This is his, these are his fingerprints. This is who he is. This is his nature. And he's making it real plain to us. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. She was a criminal caught red-handed. Okay? It would have been right and good and lawful and obedient for them to stone her. You have to understand that stoning her was the right thing to do. Just like all of us, being swept into hell would be the right thing for God to do. See? But he's not doing that. He's offering us grace and truth in our salvation. And we see this exemplified here. Neither do I condemn you. I don't condemn you. What is that? I don't condemn you. I'm not going to accuse you ever. I'm not going to condemn you ever. What is that? That is the grace of God. And then he says, go you're free. That's what the go means. It means you're free. And sin no more. Change your lifestyle. You're free now. Your chains are not going to keep you bound anymore. They're off of you. So you can live in holiness now. And you, you, you're you free because I said go. That means your chains are broken. See, we've got the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's all about. And that's so clear here. I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. And it's so funny because what does Titus 2, 12 tell us that grace does? The grace of God that never condemns you, that never accuses you. What does the grace teach us to do? The grace teaches us to say no to sin. See? That's what the grace of God does. Some people fight grace and say, well, I don't want to abuse your grace or I don't want to, um, you know, take it for granted or, or live in it too much because that would be license. Really? Well, if that's how you feel, you don't know the Lord very well because he is full, full to the top and overflowing with grace. And this grace that he gives teaches you to say no to sin. So you can be deceived sometimes thinking that if I receive too much grace, then I'm getting away with everything. You've got it backwards because when you receive the grace, it teaches you to say no to sin. It doesn't teach you to sin. 
it's it's a carnal mindset to say that grace is going to um, cause me to want to go and commit all kinds of sins. Let me go commit murder. Let me go steal and commit adultery and, and lie. Let me go do those things because God gave me grace. That's not how it works. When you're humble enough and you have a heart that believes the Lord and what his word says, not what people have told you, not what your flesh says, not how you spin things to be in the image of your parents or your strict uncle or teacher. No, when you just read the scripture as it is, the grace, if you're humble enough to receive it, changes your heart. It causes that heart of flesh to come to life and the heart of stone to just roll away. That's what the grace does. And that, and, and another factor of the grace is that it shows you in the moment, in real life, that the Lord accepts you in your sin problem because he sees the sin as separate from you. If he were under the law, using the law, he would see you as a criminal and you are one with your sin and you get stoned. But he separates the sin from the woman. See, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. He's saying you're free. I've broken your chains and sin is gone. Go free. So he separates the person from the sin and he has mercy on you and he accepts you in your struggle right there. When you get that, which you may have never ever experienced from a person, that sets you free. I'm telling you, it sets you free. So it's the enemy, it's your pride, and it's legalism, and it's um, other things that keep you from receiving the grace of God. That's what it is. It's enemy work. So what does Romans 3.20 tell us? I recently did a video on the two trees in the garden. And one of the things that the tree of knowledge gives us is sin. We get sin when we sow into the tree of knowledge. We reap sin. Well, we also, when we sow into the law, we reap sin. What does the Romans 3.20 tells us? By the law is knowledge of sin. So by the law, that the scribes and the Pharisees lived by, there is knowledge of sin. So they were really into sin, and they were really into catching people, doing things, and they were really into accusing people, and they were into condemning people. So this is a spirit, the spirit of the law of sin and death. That's what that is. So I sure hope that none of you are living with this spirit. There's a spirit that sets you free from the law of sin and death, and that is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I want you to try to herd the sheep toward that spirit. What does Romans 4.15 say? Where there is no law, there is no transgression of it. Do you see that? This is Romans 4.15. Where there is no law, there is no transgression of it. Okay? Who was trying to enforce the law? The scribes and the Pharisees. Was Jesus trying to enforce the law? No. If he did, he would have agreed with them that they should stone her. So he was saying, I've come to fulfill the law in this, in the background, big picture. I've come to fulfill the law. And things are going to be changing because I'm here. We're moving from law into grace. So he separates himself from the law. And he's declaring that the law does not apply to her. Even though the law was enforced then. He was living under the law. It was in full force. He came in and said, no. Where there is no law, he said, for this woman, the woman caught in adultery, there is no law for her. There is no law for her. I don't condemn you. See, where there's law, there's condemnation. If there's no law, there's no condemnation. I don't condemn you. Romans 8, 1. Okay? Can't really read that, but Romans 8, 1. And then, 
where there is no law, there is no transgression of it. So he freed her from her act of crime that she committed of adultery. He said, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he removed the law and set her free. Why? Because where there is no law, there is no transgression of it. So that is in action in this passage. He said, no, we're not going to enforce the law. And where there is no law, there's no transgression of it. So he could say, I do not condemn you. Because where there is no law, there's no transgression of it. And because he did not condemn her, she received his mercy, his grace, his acceptance, his kindness. And what did that teach her to do? Go and sin no more. He gave her that directive so that he could empower her and let her know that you are truly free because I've set you free by not condemning you and taking away the law from over your head. What does uh, Romans 5, 13 say? Listen to this. Sin, any sin and all sin, is not charged to anyone's account where there is no law. Anyone who believes that there is an account that you have to keep tallied up and cleared before the Lord is not familiar with this verse. Romans 5.13 says sin is not, or you could say never, charged to anyone's account where there is no law. So if there is no law, there is nothing charged no sin is charged to your account where there is no law. So if you are imagining that God is charging sins to your account, then somehow, somewhere, someplace, you are living under the law. And I'd like to, to remind you that there's one place in the universe and only one place in the universe where there is no law. We see that clearly exemplified here. It is not in the scribes and Pharisees. It is not in the law of Moses. It is not in accusing people or ourselves. It is not in thinking of ways to punish other people or ourselves. It's not in condemning ourselves or other people. It's in Jesus Christ. What do you say? He said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. He said, woman, where are your accusers? He separated himself clearly from the law here and in John 5, 45. So if any place in you is still hanging out under the law, that place is not walking with the God of grace and truth. That place is walking with the scribes and Pharisees and with the law of Moses. So again, Romans 5, 13 says, sin is not charged to anyone's account where there is no law. So I think that's very important. Only in Jesus Christ and nowhere else in the entire universe is there no law. Of Moses, there's the law of love. There's the law of love and the Holy Spirit carries you to fulfill that in your life because he gives you love for other people. So they came to test him. They came to test him and it was very clear that the law applied. But notice that Jesus didn't argue with them. He spoke. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. In this statement. He is separating himself from the law because in this statement, he's bringing up really James 2.10. James 2.10 is, says that if you're guilty of one sin, you're guilty of every sin in the world. And that is a checkmate verse. And that's what Jesus is saying here too. If you have no sin, then you can begin to condemn someone to death. And that's the same thing that James 2.10 is saying. 
No one is without original sin. It's not possible. So because no one is without it, no one can condemn. Okay, so Jesus Christ was showing mercy and compassion, and he was giving her a directive to go and sin no more. So I want to remind everybody that at the end, it's just going to be you and Jesus. There are going to be no people around. You're not going to be able to point, oh, well, she did this or he said this. It's just going to be you and him. I also want you to notice that how much dignity Jesus treated this woman with. How much dignity he gave her. I want to remind you, too, that Jesus doesn't accuse us of sins. No, he doesn't. Who accuses us of sins? The scribe, the Pharisees, the law of Moses. Spirits of accusation, spirits of condemnation, spirits of guilt. Those are all spirits, and they hang out here. They will accuse you. They will condemn you. Jesus Christ never accuses us, you or me, or anyone of sin. He forgives sin. That's what he does. Jesus Christ forgives sin. Again, Jesus Christ does not punish us. He never punishes us. He takes our punishment for us. That's what he does. So, all of the sins that you've committed, all the sins you're struggling with right now, all the mistakes you've made, all the ways you've let yourself down. When you let yourself down, you can confess to God that, sorry, Lord, I thought I was God and I thought I could perform righteousness. Please forgive me for not being God. <laughs> Okay, when you have sins that you're struggling with, when you're caught in sin, when you condemn yourself for sin, when you make mistakes, when you have struggles, when you rebel and you don't want to do what the Lord says, when you have unbelief in your heart and you're just condemning yourself and you don't know what to do, what is Jesus going to say to you in your worst, darkest moment? You know what he's going to say? I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's what he's going to say to you. And that's what he is saying to you right now. In case you don't know it, that's what he's saying to you. I do not condemn you in your struggle. I do not condemn you in your sin. So let's look at these pictures I put up here. So the pictures are over here and we have the scribes and the Pharisees up here. They're also right around here, all around the woman who is here. And here's one, and this is Jesus. And you'll notice that they are all standing around her ready to accuse her. Jesus has humbled himself and low, look at his bodily posture. He has lowered himself in humility to write on the ground in the dirt. And this woman is observing him and watching what he's doing. And she can tell that he is her friend. She can tell that he is full of compassion. His energy coming out of him is the opposite of what she feels with all of these men here. It's the opposite. These men are hard on the inside. They're hard on the inside. This man right here is soft on the inside. He's soft on the inside. And she can see that. And she knows that he is coming to rescue her. And she's watching him do it. So are you hard on the inside? Like these men here? Are you hard on the inside? Wherever there's a place inside you that's hard, it's going to be hanging out here and here and here and here and here. Wherever you're hard on the inside. So I would pray that any place in you that is hard on the inside, that you would pour out that place to the Lord Jesus. 
Let him take it from you and give you mercy to put in the place where that hardness used to be. A place of soft, strong mercy into that place. And then you can be soft on the inside like Jesus is. Then, when you're soft on the inside like Jesus is, you will not want to hang out here, here, and here. Because you will know that there is no life there. That there is no love there. There is no grace there. There is no mercy there. There is no forgiveness there. That's not where the Lord Jesus hangs out. He hangs out where there is, or he is, the mercy seat of God. So, you could say wherever there is mercy and compassion, his spirit is there. Mercy and compassion to other people. Mercy and compassion to those who should be condemned, who were caught in the act. And mercy and compassion to your own self. Your own self. All right? So that's my prayer. That wherever there is any place in you that is hard on the inside, that you would pour out that hard, dead place to Jesus Christ and let him pour his life into that place. Okay? So this is 38 minutes. I think it's time to stop. I don't want to keep y'all too long, but this is just something I've been thinking about this afternoon, and I wanted to share it. It's very important. So remember, where there's no condemnation, there is no sin. I gave you those verses. I'll give them to you again. It's this whole passage in John 8. It's also Romans 3.20, Romans 4.15, Romans 5.13. Titus 2.12, just to remind you of the verses that I went over. Okay, so I hope this is helpful. I hope this opens your eyes to some things you didn't see before. And I hope mainly that this will help you take one step closer to the Lord. One step closer. Okay, that's my prayer. I'll see you soon.